Well, praise the Lord. It is Wednesday night, time for our midweek Bible study. We greet you this evening in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're happy to have you with us today. We will be continuing our study uh, that I have titled LGBT Affirming Theology. And uh, I think tonight, like in previous weeks, I think there's going to be a lot of great information that will be a blessing and a help to you. And um, it's going to be very, very enlightening. Uh, this, you know, the title is deceptive because I think a lot of people think, well, that subject's for them, you know, that's not for me. That, that's not a subject I need to be at all concerned with. Oh, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Um, there is nothing, the Word of God said, there's nothing in biblical prophecy that is of a private interpretation. Now, this isn't prophecy per se, so I'm stretching that passage a little bit. The only difference is I acknowledge I'm stretching it, okay? Um, but there is nothing in the Word of God, folks, that as you study and you seek it out, that it has only an application for this or for that one. Um, as you study the Word of the Lord, you will always find that there is a lot of information and a lot of application uh, for any number of people. So whether you're LGBT today or not, uh, you are going to glean an awful lot from this Bible study. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin this evening. Master, we love you, God, and we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to go to the Word of God, to seek out the truth, the wisdom, the enlightenment, the revelation, the counsel that your sacred, wonderful text offers us today. Master, tonight I ask God that the spirit of revelation would flow from this place as people are watching and listening, whether it be live, whether it be later, by reason of recording, there is no time nor space in God. But I pray, Lord, that you would open minds, open hearts, reveal truth, because the Word of God promises you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And Master, tonight, anoint your teacher, Anoint every student, every individual listening, watching. Let the presence of God confirm in their hearing that that which they hear is indeed the Word of God. Help me to speak the truth of God, to speak it clearly, plainly, in love, so that every hearer might receive it. <coughs> we ask all this tonight in none other then Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Praise God and amen. Well, I'll tell you, today I was doing some heavy-duty research and study. I've been looking into these matters for years and years, and it is so interesting to me because every time I sit down and start doing any kind of research, a lot of times there's like a new caveat or a new... Uh, avenue that will open up and um, uh, the Lord will put a thought in my head, you know, and help me to um, see something that maybe I've never seen before. And then I begin to research down a new path, you know. And boy, today did I do that. I spent hours and hours and hours and hours um, creating notes for some future uh, Bible studies. I could have, um, uh, I could have changed tonight's uh, direction a little bit, but I didn't want to do that because I've already done that to y'all 
uh, once or twice. I wanted to start out before we looked at these couple. There are only a couple of passages within the context of the Old Testament law of Moses. Before we got into those passages, I wanted you to have a clear understanding of the nature and the purpose of the law. I guarantee you, this is something the Lord kind of dropped in my spirit today. I guarantee you that most of you have already forgotten half of what I said concerning uh, the Old Testament, the law, as, uh, you know, its purpose and its mission. Um, a lot of you have already forgotten. And the reason I say that is because if you've been raised in a fundamentalist or an evangelical camp especially, then you tend to fall back very quickly, very easily into a legalistic mindset. And it's so funny because fundamentalists and evangelicals love to decry the Roman Catholic religion and the uh, Episcopalian, you know, as being legalistic and ritualistic and all. And, uh, and they are, but... Uh, the funny thing is, they have their own brand of legalism. They have their own brand, honey. Uh, and as a matter of fact, they are uh, probably far more legalistic than a lot of these others. Now listen, folks, if, if you're new to our ministry and you haven't been around us very long, uh, you're going to have to learn and you're going to have to get used to the fact that... Uh, that Pastor Charles only knows how to talk one way, and that is plain. I don't have time to mince words and try to be all sweet and, you know, cute the way I word things. I don't, I don't try to say things to be hurtful. I don't try to say things to be nasty. That's not what I mean. I'm not talking about not having any kind of a filter, but I'm talking about uh, I tend oftentimes just come out and say things that need to be said. Well, one of the things as I start this study tonight, one of the things that I was contemplating uh, before this evening while I was doing all my other research, Tommy, I was thinking people need to understand that two of the most abusive perverted twisters of Scripture in our world today. <laughs> I'm going to set some people on their ear. Are the Southern Baptist Convention, they, they twist and pervert the Word of God worse than most. And the Church of Christ those are two of, if you come from one of those backgrounds, um, you, like someone who is trying to come out of a cult, because there is very much a cult mentality within uh, these groups. You know, my grandmother, years ago, my grandmother, who was a fundamentalist Christian, Assemblies of God, she told me many, many years ago, she said, you know, I read an article recently that talked about ex-fundamentalists and how people were coming out of fundamentalism and how uh, they, they view fundamentalism as cultish and blah, blah, blah. And she said, and boy, I'm going to tell you, she said, when I started reading this article, I was just offended. I was really troubled by the way they were saying things, you know. And my grandmother, I mean, she was a fierce fundamentalist, believe me. And then she said, but do you know what? She said, the more I read that article, she said, I didn't see a lot of the traits they were talking about in the assemblies of God. She said, but one of her daughters, my aunt, had begun to go to a Baptist church. And my grandmother said, all of a sudden, as I'm reading this article, she said, everything they were talking about she said, that daughter demonstrates. 
every single thing. She said, you, uh, you try to talk to them about the Word of God or, or uh, debate with them concerning Scripture, and without fail, they're going to go to, well, my pastor says, because the mentality is, you're supposed to believe what you believe, not because the Word of God says it. They, they sort of kind of try to suggest that in a roundabout way. But ultimately, it is whatever my pastor says, the Word of God says. So while on one hand, they're claiming fidelity to Scripture, the reality is they're not, they're not being faithful to the Word of God. They're being faithful to their pastor's interpretation of the Word of God. And many of you out there, our church, I, we are unapologetically, I'm going to say this straight up because we don't hide things. We're not a cult. We don't try to get you through the door of our church and then slap you later with surprises. We are an apostolic Pentecostal, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, tongue talking, shouting down the aisles church. One of the things that really helped me to realize how intellectually dishonest fundamentalists are, because again, remember, I grew up in an Assemblies of God church. I came into the apostolic movement as a young man. I had already pastored two churches with the Church of God out of Cleveland, Tennessee when I uh, made the move into the apostolic movement. And when I came into the apostolic movement, all of a sudden, it was that that helped me to look back at the fundamentalists and realize, holy mackerel, do they torture the Word of God. Do they torture the Word of God? Our ministry over the years, I've been doing uh, um, what I like to use the term now more than LGBT affirming even, is simply progressive. I've been involved in progressive ministry now for 30 years. And uh, one of the things about the ministry that I've been doing for the last 30 years is we have helped more people who do not come from Pentecostal or apostolic background. Now, have we had people in our church who were from Pentecostal apostolic? Yes, we have. But we have had Lutherans, we've had Catholics, we've had um, uh, Episcopalians, we've had Baptists, I mean, you name uh, Methodists, you name any group within the Christian world. And this church has had members who loved our church, and without fail, they would walk away saying, I have never learned so much, I have never understood the Word of God so clearly and so well as I have since coming to this church. Had people tell me that over and over and over for the last 30 years. And the reason is simple, because within the apostolic faith, folks, you may not understand this, and I know the word apostolic has a very negative connotation thanks to certain people within the movement, but I want you to understand that uh, the movement as a whole is not the United Pentecostal Church, and the United Pentecostal Church is not the movement. There are many apostolic denominations and congregations which do not have that stinking, self-righteous, holier-than-thou, ridiculous spirit that is so prevalent uh, in United Pentecostal people. And I'm sorry to say that I have folks in my family who are United Pentecostal. <coughs> and I love <coughs> any number of people within that organization. And our ministry supports 
the children of missionaries in that organization. Every year we give a minimum of $1,200 a year in support of a missionary program. That helps to support the children of missionaries. We don't want them suffering. We don't want them going hungry. We don't want them going without their needs being met because they're on the mission field with mom and dad. We don't agree, obviously, with any number of positions that organization takes. But, like I've said before, our mission is not to be segregated and to go off here and do our own thing. Our mission is to do things the way they ought to be done. And the way it ought to be done, the Bible said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the abbreviated version. Uh, the way it ought to be done is we should do things and treat people the way that we would like to be treated. I'd love for them to be able to look at us and say, well, we disagree on some things, but I can still love you and I can still be supportive of you. They'll never do it, but I would like that. So we look at them that way. We say, well, there's a lot of stuff we disagree with. There's a lot of points that we're not in line with, but we can still be supportive of your mission efforts because, frankly, the salvation message of Acts 2.38 is more important to me than anything in this universe. And I want that message preached, and that denomination preaches it. So we found a way to be supportive of their missions program without, per se, be, you know, directly supporting the, the missionaries, if you know what I'm saying. You know, we're supporting the children because they're in involuntarily in foreign countries on foreign soil living amongst people that a lot of times they don't know the language you know they don't know the culture and these kids deserve our support amen all right listen we want to move in now um i've been promising for weeks we were going to look at the couple of passages and there are only a couple in the old testament law that deal with uh, what, well, we're commonly told that they deal with homosexuality. But I want to begin tonight by reading to you Let me start out by reading to you Leviticus 18. Now this is 30 verses, but I'm going to read the entire thing because part of the mistake people make when uh, interpreting Scripture and reading Scripture, they pull things out of context. You pull one verse out as if God was just sitting there going like this. Well, let me see. Don't chew gum. Um, don't drink Cokes. Um, um, Get up at 6 in the morning. Let's see, what should I say next? You know what I'm saying? We act like God is just dropping arbitrary thoughts into the mind of the inspired writer. And in this case, where the law is concerned, God gave the law to Moses personally. And Moses is writing everything God's telling him, okay? And so it's important. It's, it's more than important. It is integral. When you study, especially when you study the law of Moses, that you keep everything in proper context because a lot of times there's some very important information that is included a little before, a little after, you know, and to pull it out of context and not include that, then you're losing some very important information, okay? Leviticus 18. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, not to the world, not to the universe, not to all people of the world. Speak to the children of Israel, because the law was for Israel, to Israel. And say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein ye dwelt, shall ye not do. 
and after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, ye shall not do, neither shall ye walk in their ordinance. So before the Lord even starts with the thou shalt nots, he, he, he lays a very important foundation. He said, listen, all of these thou shalt nots that I'm about to give you are based on two things. Things you saw in Egypt while you were 400 years captive there and things you're going to see in Canaan, the land that I'm giving you. He said, I don't want you doing like Egypt, nor do I want you doing like the people in Canaan. Now, keep that in mind as we read through this list, because every one of these things must have had some association with conduct in Egypt and conduct in Canaan. Okay? Verse 4, Ye shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances, mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. He is carving out a nation and a people unto himself. Part of, like we talked about before, one of the greatest aspects of the law is simply that God was trying to create a unique people. People who did things very differently than the rest of the world. We talked about some of the laws, and we're going to go through some here in a second. Um, it, it's not about what is good and what isn't good what is bad and what is evil and what's wicked. No, that was not the purpose of half these laws. had nothing to do with what was good or what was bad. Not eating shellfish, that it doesn't mean eating shellfish is evil. Nowhere does the Lord suggest that, you know, just eating shrimp or having a lobster makes you wicked. Yet, at the same time, God labels shellfish amongst other beasts and animals, unclean. He said, this is clean, this is unclean. You are not to touch the unclean things. Listen to me, children. It is an abomination. So he labels eating shellfish an abomination. Touching anything that God has labeled unclean, including foods and what have you, was considered abomination. Okay, and I'm going to go down a list shortly of abominations. But let's continue. He said, Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man do, he shall live in them. I am the Lord. None of you shall approach to any that is near of kin to him, to uncover their nakedness, I am the Lord. That is incest, okay? He's saying no incest. First item on the list, incest. Verse 7, the nakedness of thy father or the nakedness of thy mother shalt thou not uncover. She is thy mother, thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. So in other words, you're, you're not to engage in uh, sexual intimacy with your, your parents, okay, obviously. He said, verse 8, The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover, it is thy father's nakedness. So, he is saying here, you're not going to be involved intimately with your father's wife again. You have to remember, he doesn't say here with your mother. For all those who want to stand there and lie in the fundamentals community, because they love to do that, they love to twist and pervert scripture till it's not even funny. Marriage has been from the beginning between one man and one woman. You're a lying sack of potatoes. Right here in this 
passage. Straight folks, remember what I told you? There's stuff here you can benefit from too. Right here in this passage, he says clearly to begin with, you're not going to get naked with mom. Then he said, and you're not going to get naked with your father's wife. Well, you, you can't be very bright if you think he's talking about the same person. No. Polygamy was very common in the early days, and therefore, a man, could, that a person could have a mother, obviously, who's married to his father, but he could also have any number of additional wives. Here, the Lord is saying, you don't get naked with mommy, and you don't get naked with any of your father's wives. Okay? So, he goes on to say, uh, verse 9, the nakedness of thy sister, the daughter of thy father, or daughter of thy mother, whether she be born at home or born abroad, even their nakedness shalt thou not uncover. All of these rules so far are all in what category? Well, it, it's all about incest. So far, we haven't even gotten out of the realms of incest. When's the last time you heard Franklin Graham preach on incest? When's the last time you heard John Hagee talk about incest? When's the last time you heard Ron Parsley, Rod Parsley, get out there and preach a good old-fashioned Holy Ghost message on incest? Oh, they don't. And yet we know in modern America that incest is a major problem. Molestation of children is primarily carried out by members of their same family. We know this to be a statistical fact. Yet you never hear incest spoken of within the church. Then he goes on to say uh, in verse 10, The nakedness of thy son's daughter or of thy daughter's daughter, so like your, uh, your uh, grandchildren, he said, uh, Even their nakedness shalt thou not uncover, for theirs is thine own nakedness. The nakedness of thy father's wife's daughter begotten of thy father. So now it's not your mother, it's not your, it's not the child born to your mom and dad, but to your dad and another woman, another wife that he has. Are you following this? Yes, marriage has always been between one man and one woman. I get so sick and tired. I do. I get sick and tired of the lies and the deceit and the foolishness <coughs> that these people use. They torture the word of God torture it. So he said the nakedness of, uh, of thy father's wife's daughter because now that's your half-sister, okay? Um, oh, the nakedness of thy son's daughter of thy daughter's daughter, even their naked. The nakedness of thy wife's, verse 11, wife's daughter begotten of thy father. <coughs> she is thy sister. She's a half-sister, as we would call it. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's sister, your aunt. She is thy father's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister. Notice again, folks, I've talked about this a thousand times. The law is explicit. To such a degree, it isn't even funny. God doesn't say, you are not to be intimate with your aunts and uncles. Mm -mm. Nope. Nope. He makes it abundantly clear. He goes down gender for gender. He breaks it down to such a degree that there can 
be no misunderstanding. Well, you know, I thought that since my aunt was my father's um, half-sister, that they didn't share the same father, that I could be intimate with her, you know, uh, even though it said, don't be intimate with your aunts, and do you follow what I'm saying? No, because then you're saying, well, you know, because my aunt would be my father's actual full-blooded sister. But the Lord breaks it down. He breaks it down. He makes it so abundantly clear, which is important to remember and understand when we get down a little bit and we get to that magic passage that everybody chokes on. Um, remember how specific God is in his communications. So then in verse 13, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy mother's sister. So here he goes, father, sister, mother, sister, literally breaks it down per individual. For she is thy mother's near kinswoman. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy father's brother. Thou shalt not approach to his wife. She is thine aunt. So your father's brother, who is your uncle, you can't be with her, the, his wife's, uh, your uncle's wife, because she is your aunt. Not by blood. There's no blood between you. But as soon as marriage comes into the picture, the rules change. Oh, I'm going to tell you. Do you know how many Christian people there are out there in the world who have done these things? And yet they'll have the audacity to sin in judgment of other people. Let's continue. Uh, verse 15, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy daughter-in-law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy brother's wife. It is thy brother's nakedness. Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. So he's saying, you cannot marry a woman and at the same time marry her daughter. Again, you've got to remember, polygamy was common. So he's saying, you know, you cannot be intimate with a woman and at the same time be intimate with her daughter. Oh, the Mormons who practice polygamy. <laughs> Guess what, honey? They don't follow these rules. Oh, they claim, you know, that polygamy is of God, and but they don't follow God's rules where polygamy is concerned, okay? So he goes on to say, uh, Verse 17, thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter, neither shalt thou take her son's daughter or her daughter's daughter. So he goes down even a generation further, okay, to uncover her nakedness, for they are her near kinswoman. It is wickedness. I want to stop for a moment. Some of y'all are probably saying, I notice it's all about what women are, are off limits. If you notice, this is perfect. And many people, especially in the LGBT community, we have people who get upset because the Bible is very patriarchal and, you know, um, men are kind of uh, held up and featured. But this helps to illustrate and helps you to understand, listen to me carefully, how God puts the responsibility, oh my Lord, on who? Amen. The men. The men. So when that little girl winds up pregnant, you know, and you say, well, she could have done something. No, 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 honey. God puts the responsibility on you to make the right decisions and to do the right things. You're the one that God expects. Because while it's all well and good to try to suggest that the Bible elevates men and makes them more important and makes them, it also puts a much greater burden of responsibility and accountability on men. 
Isn't that something? See how wonderful that is? Isn't that? That's an important point, isn't it? Amen. All right. Uh, verse 18, Neither shalt thou take a wife to her sister to vex her, to uncover her nakedness beside the other in wickedness. Oh, my goodness, Lord, your laws are... In other words, you don't drag your wife so she can watch you have sex with her sister just so you can make her mad and get her upset. Uh -uh. Are there people who do such things? Oh, yeah. There are people who run out and have an affair. Well, my husband had an affair, so I went out and had an affair with his brother to get back at him. Ooh. How many times have you heard that on television? How many times have you heard that on Maury Povich? How many times have you heard that on Jerry Springer and all these other goofball shows? Well, I had an affair with my husband's brother. I had an affair with my husband's father. According to the law of Moses, all these acts were forbidden. Okay? Verse 19 Also thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for un her uncleanness. In other words, during a woman's period, while she's in that time of the month, you are not to engage in intimacy with a woman while she is in her time of the month, while she's in her cycle. I, I don't even dare want to touch on that. How many men could care less about what and how? Hello now. My Lord, have mercy. Uh, also, thou shalt not, excuse me, verse 20, Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her, and thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord. Okay, interesting. All the way through verse 18, God was in essence defining uh, incest, okay? 18 verses, he's defining incest. He breaks it down to the generation. He breaks it down. Every relationship, I mean, he breaks it down so there's no misunderstanding whatsoever. All of a sudden now, in verse number 21, it changes. All of a sudden now, the subject matter turns to idolatry. Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. This was a, uh, a false god in ancient times. They practiced uh, sacrifice of children, and the Lord said, You will not do this. You will not engage in this idolatrous practice. Then we get to the magic scripture, and we're only eight away. I'm going to finish reading this chapter, but we'll come back to this in a minute. Neither shalt, excuse me, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with mankind. It is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Def now, again, we just had idolatry in verse 21, and then most people will tell you verse 22 went to homosexuality. And then verse 23 goes to bestiality. Verse 24 said, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. 
For in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. So unless homosexuality is some practice that is well known in the ancient world, and it was commonly practiced in Egypt, and it was commonly practiced in Canaan, because according to the Lord, all these things he's just listed, he said, these are things, now remember how he started. He said, I don't want you doing what Egypt did. I don't want you doing what the Canaanites do. So obviously this list then has to be applicable in some manner, in some way. It has to apply to the Canaanites and or to the Egyptians, okay? He said, uh, and the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity upon, thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Ye shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, and shall not commit any of these, any of these abominations. So that whole list is abominations. Just because the word abominations appears in one verse, you think, oh, this is the only abomination. No, 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 honey. Every item on that list falls under the heading of abominations. Neither any of your own nation nor any stranger that sojourneth among you. So he's saying... Uh, it, not only you, but anybody that's part of your nation, whether they be an immigrant, you know, whether they be someone seeking asylum. Once you come into the land that God is giving the people of Israel, once you come into their country, listen, children, you are bound by that law. This law was given to a nation. It was given to a people. It was not given to be applied worldwide. It was given for Israel. That alone should solve a lot of questions, okay? But it doesn't. Verse 27. For all these abominations <coughs> have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled that the land spew not you out also, who, when ye defile it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them, shall be cut off from among their people. Therefore shall ye keep my ordinance, that ye commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that ye defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. So again, you see the Lord drawing that line of... Uh, Distinction. I am trying to carve a people out unto myself. I, I want you to be unique among the nations. I'm setting some very strict rules. But these rules make you unique. These rules identify you as belonging to me, as worshipers of me, as those who serve me. If you think of it in these terms, when you join the military, you have to learn the military code. You've got to follow all the military rules to the letter. If they say, when you make your bed, the, you know, I've got to be able to bounce a quarter off of that bed, then that's how you have to make that bed. You're not going to, the, your superior is not going to let you go just because you're a slob and you make it sloppily. Am I telling the truth? 
Those of you who have served in the military, you know what I'm talking about. My father briefly served in the Marines, and he used to love to brag about it and talk about it, how strict they were, how strict their rules were, you know. Uh, but when you go into the military, you have to follow all of their, and half their rules don't make any sense. Half the rules, you would think, don't have anything to do with anything. But it does, because what it's doing is it is helping you to establish, listen to me, folks, within your character. It's not that making your bed sloppily is going to, you know, make you a bad guy or a bad soldier or anything else. No, 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 no. But learning to follow the rules, learning to do everything exactly the way you're instructed to do it helps you to build character. And this is what God was trying. He was trying to carve a people out unto himself, not merely who quote-unquote kept the rules, but who developed the character that he wanted within them. Okay? And you notice he said, these abominable customs. What does customs mean? It means it's customary. This is something they do regularly. You know, one of the things that uh, I have to point out, if you think, if you think ancient people were as anal and as sexually fixated as post-Victorian uh, Americans especially, if you think the ancient world looked upon all things sexual the way that uh, modern man tends to look at all things sexual. I'm going to say it plain. I told you out on the house that you're an idiot. You're a flat, flat, flat out idiot. My great grandmother lived to be 89. Uh, she died in the uh, mid to late 90s, uh, 1990s, and we were talking one time, and it was kind of funny, my grandmother, who gave me a lot of grief after I came out, my grandmother was saying to me, well, you know, back in our day, we didn't have gay people running around. You know, there weren't any gay people. That's all become, you know, real popular. All of a sudden, it's become popularized, and, you know, and boy, she preached to me a sermon. And my 89-year-old grandmother, who never gave me a minute's grief, she loved me the same way after I come out as she did before I come out. My great-grandmother sat there and said, Oh, for crying out loud, Eleanor. Good Lord. That's foolish. That's foolish. You're crazy. And my grandmother looked at her, her, her mother and said, well, what are you talking about, Mom? We didn't have any homosexuals. We didn't know any homosexuals. And my great-grandmother said, we most certainly did. Don't you remember those two men that used to live around the corner from us? And blah, 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 blah. And my grandmother said, well, yeah, I remember them. said, but they weren't on that ground of the council. My great-grandmother said, oh, yes, they were. Said, you remember those ladies that lived over here? Ba, ba, ba. And my grandma said, well, yeah, I remember them, but they were sisters. And my great grandma said, oh, Helena, how, how naive can you be? They weren't sisters. They didn't look anything alike, they, you know. She said, no. She said, back in our day, whatever you did, Privately, was your business. Whatever, what, and it, 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 we didn't give a flying fig if people were gay or straight or what. She said, my God, when I was young, she said, now, you know, sometimes, especially your macho men, you know, would make a comment about a guy being a little light on his feet. You know, they would tease effeminate men or what have you. She said, but as far as because back then it was a put down to refer to a man as as being anything like a girl, 
You know, friend, if you say to a boy, oh, you're acting like a little girl. That was a put down, okay? And so my great grandmother, you know, sometimes they say, oh, well, he acts like a little woman. You know, he acts like a little girl. But they never, she said, they, they didn't talk about anything sexual because sexual was private. We didn't discuss it. As long as anything you did didn't affect me in my life, we could care less. We did business with you. We visited with you. We talked with you. We went into your home. You came into our home. She said, we didn't, you know, that was something. Folks, that was a hundred years ago. Go back thousands of years. The reality is, in the ancient world, sexual practice was extremely private. It was not subject to public scrutiny. It is the sexual revolution of the 1960s and 1970s that brought all things sexual out into the streets. And while there are people who scream and holler about gay pride and, well, how dare they parade their sexuality out in the streets, um, sweetheart, they're not doing anything you don't do. The reality is the sexual revolution brought heterosexuality out into the public space as well as homosexuality. It's, it's, it's not like one did something the other did. No, no, no. They all come out together. You know, it was all this thing. Oh, you know, instead of being ashamed of sex and sex, because, you know, you watch Archie Bunker on television, he can't even say the word Edith nearly passes out when her daughter tries to talk to her about the subject of it. That's how things used to be, and it, it really was to the point of being absurd, because certainly a mother should be able to talk to her daughter, and a daughter should be able to talk to her mother. You know, a father should be able to talk to a son. No, instead... They, they went around letting the poor kid learn everything he learned about sex on the streets. And that's how it worked for millennium, not for a few decades. That's how it was for millennium. Sex, sexual conduct, sexual practices were not a matter of public record. You were not, all of your behavior was not under public scrutiny. This is something that has come into existence just in the last century we have seen this. And yet, if you listen to the Baptists and you listen to Church of Christ and you listen to fundamentalists tell it, they'll try to tell you that the ancient world had the same exact viewpoint concerning sex that we do. Baloney. Your puritanical obsession with sex is not even close to anything that the ancient world uh, embraced. That's not how they behave. That's not how they approach things. What was done in private, the Apostle Paul said, it's a shame to even speak of those things which are done in secret. So even in Paul's day, you didn't talk about what people did privately. When Paul wrote about the Romans in Romans 1, he did so because they were open and they were flagrant in their conduct. Their, their reputation was, traveled the world. Everybody around the planet knew how vulgar and obscene and idolatrous Rome was and the Roman people as a rule, okay? So... Uh, so get that out of your head to start with. They did not have the same attitude concerning sex that we have today. Now, verse 22 is our text that most people uh, will throw at a person who is LGBT. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. 
It is an abomination. One thing I will always do is be honest and straightforward. I'm not going to sit here and twist scripture and pervert scripture just to try to make it say something it doesn't say. I can't do that, folks. It's just not in me. Mankind comes from the Hebrew word zakar. Zakar means simply a male. Period. A male. But, but it also means, see, this is where people go to their Bible dictionary and they open it up and they look and this is Zakar, a male, and they stop. As a verb, Zakar means to be remembered or to be thought of, or to be revered, or to be held up. To make a memorial, or to keep in remembrance. So when he says mankind, man shall not lie with a man as he'd lie with a woman, he is not simply saying a male. He is talking about a specific type of male. One who is held up, one who is esteemed, one who uh, has some special status or some special place, okay? The word womankind is isha, which is female, right? You know, as you lie with a woman, a wife, a female, okay? Now, I'm going to quickly move, because I want to try to get through all this. I'm going to quickly move right to the second passage. And the reason I'm doing this is it's going to help you to understand. Excuse me, the, the first passage. Wait a minute. No, I don't want to do that either, actually. No, I, I'm not going to do that either. I, th I think I'm going to approach it a little bit differently. Okay, having, having then established the fact that the law was given to God as an example or a school teacher to the Church of Christ, which would later be established as one people under the blood covenant, the purpose of the law being to establish forever within our hearts and minds the sure fact that we as human beings need a Savior. That was the primary purpose of the law. So in other words, God basically made virtually everything <laughs> illegal. But he did that on purpose because that way the people who don't break 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 are bound to break 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. You follow what I'm saying? So the law was literally designed to be impossible to fully and completely live and maintain. The purpose for that was not, not God trying to make it impossible on people. He was trying to, like I talked about in previous studies, he was trying to build a hunger and an anticipation for the Savior. He wanted them to long, to recognize, Lord, I want to do your law. I want to abide by Torah. I want to do everything you teach us to do. But I can't. Therefore, I need a Savior. We talked before about uh, the requirements of the law to even prosecute anybody. So even a, an offense that had a death penalty attached to it, God himself established criteria that made it almost impossible for anyone to even be charged. So, human beings are imperfect, they can't keep the law. Most of the time, it's impossible for the law to be fully uh, implemented because God himself made the criteria so difficult. Do you not see, like I was talking about last week, the grace that God built into the whole process. You see, when we study in the law, when you get these evangelicals and these fundamental pulling scriptures out of context, instead of looking at the whole, they look at the part. 
Jesus said they gag at gnats and swallow camels. Because something little they gag on. They can't even begin to understand the big picture. Can't even begin to see the big picture. Does this mean there were no homosexuals in ancient Israel? Of course not. Does this mean that gay people in, uh, in ancient Israel were dragged out in the streets and stoned? No. No. Because to have done that, they everybody that stoned that man would have been guilty of murder. Because they didn't go through the legal process. Doesn't matter if the person was guilty or not guilty by reason of behavior and action. But the truth of the matter is, uh, you had to go through a specific process. And God himself, himself, set forth the criteria. So basically what he does, he creates this impossible situation. The law, keeping the law. But he also creates criteria that makes uh, punishment virtually impossible. The only one who can mete out punishment without having to go through the process, the legal process, was who? God. <laughs> That's why he was able to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Because God can mete out punishment without having to go through the process. But man had to go, you had to have at least two witnesses. They had to have seen uh, the uh, incident themselves with their own eyes. They had to have issued a warning and the person had to have continued to do what they were doing in spite of the warning right in front of them. I mean, the criteria was so stringent, okay? So we're seeing, in essence, we are seeing a type and a model of grace. But instead, we've got people today in the church world who still look at New Testament salvation and New Testament Christianity through the same legalistic, idiotic, unrealistic eyes of many of the Old Testament Jews who thought, oh, I can keep Torah, I can keep all the rules, I can do all the things that the law calls for. And yet when Jesus came, he was constantly, 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 constantly calling out their hypocrisy. And he was saying, no, no, no. Y'all want to stand there and say you keep all the rules, but you do this and you don't do this. You do this and you don't do that. Oh, well, you pay tithes and you do all these things, but the weightier matters of the law, like justice and mercy, oh, those you don't want anything to do with. Do you follow what I'm saying? So the Lord made it abundantly clear that even the most righteous in their own minds in his day fell short of the law. Jesus didn't come so that all of a sudden, by some magic power, after conversion, we would be able to keep the law. No. You receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you, it'll help you, it'll help you do a lot of things, and it'll help you to be a witness and a testimony. But it will not make you perfect doesn't make you perfect. The Apostle Paul made it abundantly clear. As long as we're in this life, we are corruptible. He didn't say corrupted. He said corruptible. Meaning, we can be corrupted. We can do wrong. We can act wrong. He said, and when this corruptible shall put on incorruptible, in corruption. When we finally are redeemed from this life, we change a nature that is subject to sin that is corruptible for a nature that no longer is subject to sin and that cannot be corrupted. Hallelujah. But in the meantime, we've got this whole theology 
built up around the notion that, oh, we're supposed to be perfect. We're supposed to follow all of God's rules. My God, you did not learn the lesson that the law of Moses was meant to teach. The law of Moses, in its entirety, not just the rules and regulations, but also the restrictions and the manner with which it was to be carried out, demonstrate grace. We should be getting a lesson from that of grace, but we don't. All right. <sighs> we saw that the law was relentless in its detail and impossible to genuinely implement by any human being. We also saw that the law lent itself to religious zealots who thought themselves capable of living up to every code and commandment. It was these zealots who later delivered the Lord to be crucified as he did not embrace their legalism and their legalistic codes as they would have had him to do. So now it's imperative for us at this stage in our study to fully understand one cannot possibly study the legalistic codes of the law without taking into consideration the times and customs of the day during which these laws were established. I want to offer an example. My 17-year-old nephew lived with Tommy and I for a while. And I had certain rules that I established for him, one of which was I wanted him in the house uh, about sundown every day. I wanted him to be in the house, didn't want him out there roaming the streets and what have you after dark. And if you don't understand the city we lived in, if you don't understand the community we lived in, if you don't understand the context of my establishing this rule. You may look and say, well, that's an awful, ridiculous rule. No man should tell his kid he can't be out after dark for crying out loud. Don't you know? You should be able to trust your kid to be out until at least 9 or 10 o'clock, you know, and blah, 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 blah. But when you understand where we live, when you understand what goes on after dark and what uh, dangers exist, then you better understand why I would have made that rule. When you understand the customs of biblical times, all of a sudden a lot of these rules that the Lord implemented, a lot of these laws that he implemented, begin to make a whole lot more sense. The problem is we have people who approach the Word of God as law rather than love. It is not a book of law. The gospel is not a book of law. It is a message of love and grace. Leviticus 18, 21 through 15, and that includes verse 22. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shalt any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomit out her inhabitants. I've included with verse 22, our, our major, you know, clobber passage here, the context in which it appears in Scripture. It's important that we do so in order that we might fully understand 
the full import of what Moses here was saying. Now, Leviticus 20, 12 through 15, particularly verse 13, here's the other clobber passage. And if a man lie with his daughter-in-law, both of them shall surely be put to death. They have wrought confusion. Their blood shall be upon them. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. And if a man take a wife and her mother, it is wickedness. They shall be burnt with fire. They weren't to be stoned. They were literally to be, in essence, burned at the stake, okay? Both he and they, that there be no wickedness among you. And if a man lie with a beast, he shall surely be put to death and ye shall slay the beast. Remember first and foremost that the law was given to Moses as an express contract between God and the people of Israel. Part of the reason for the law was for God to separate unto himself a people who would live and act right based upon the precepts and teachings offered within his law. Also, Notice that Moses is writing within the law a series of prohibitions that the people of Israel are to observe. In verse 21, he begins by writing that the Israelites are not to imitate the behavior and practices and customs of the followers of the false god Molech. The adherents to that religion engaged in a practice where their children were made to pass through fire. God declared that his people were not to engage in similar practices. To do so, he states, would be to besmirch and profane the name of the Lord God Jehovah. Then in verse 22, the Lord goes on to say that the people of Israel, the subject in the sentence is always the people of Israel when the Lord says, Thou shalt not. So when you read, Thou shalt not, that is specifically written to and for the nation of Israel, meaning the people of Israel shall not lie with mankind as with womankind. There is likely no single verse in the Bible that the King James translators did a worse job translating than this one. They employed what sounds like very broad gender-specific terms, mankind and womankind, leading most uneducated readers to believe that this means simply that mankind means any male and womankind means females in general. Unfortunately, this is not the case. The true meaning in these verses, both of them that we've read, both of these clobber passages from the Law of Moses, is actually found within the term abomination, which the Lord states specifically. You remember how at the end of the chapter he says abomination and it applies to all the lists. Yet, it's only when he speaks of man lying with man that he actually uses the word abomination in that specific verse. There's a reason. God does nothing by accident. There is a reason for this. Listen. The true meaning uh, is found in the literal translation of the term abomination that you read in these verses, which the Lord states such behavior would constitute. <clears throat> For instance, if I say that to do such and such uh, is a travesty, that means one thing. 
if I say that for one to do such and such is a felony, obviously there's an entirely different meaning implied in my statement. One speaks of a moral wrong, travesty. The other speaks of a prosecutable injustice, which the law of the land has clearly defined as illegal and punishable by time in prison. Now listen, I'm going to read to you several translations, three anyway, four, no, I'm sorry, don't mind me, um, two translations. First I'm going to start with the KJV, Leviticus 18.22, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind, it is abomination. The NIV says, same passage, Do not lie with a man as one lies with a woman. That is detestable. Leviticus 20, 13, the KJV says, If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. NIV, Leviticus 20, 13, if a man lies with a man as one lies with a woman, both of them have done what is detestable. They must be put to death. Their blood will be on their own heads. In both Leviticus 18, 22 and 20, uh, verse 13, the term we see describing the nature of the particular offense in question in the King James is abomination. In the NIV, they use the word detestable. The Lord, the truth is, the Lord was plainly saying to his people that the, the act he of four described constituted, listen to me, children, an act of idolatry. Tawabe which is translated by the KJV as abomination and by the NIV as detestable. Strong's Dictionary of Hebrew Old Testament Words states the definition is as follows. Tawabe has a primary meaning of an association with idolatry or concretely of an idol itself, especially idolatry or an idol. What does this mean to us? It means to us the fact that that word is attached to that specific passage. Mm -hmm. That God is not talking about just any intimate act between two men. And by the way, I'll repeat this again, there is no prohibition in the universe, in the law of Moses, that applies to women. There's not one word said in the law concerning women with women. Also, again, we talked about how specific. God broke down so specifically the nature of incest, and he broke down all the relationships and all the manifestations that that could take, okay? And yet, in Leviticus, twice, he says only man lying with a man as with a woman. The Hebrew scholars tell us that this specifically prohibits one singular physical act. One specific act. This is not nowhere in the wording of this passage is God identifying any group of people. He is not trying to say, Homo, thou shalt not practice homosexuality. That is not even close to what God says here. Not even close says there's one specific act, but again, between men, 
And there is that idolatrous connotation. Why would he say that? It's easy, because in the ancient world, idolatrous same-sex uh, encounters were regularly practiced. This was part of the ancient world. It was well known. It was well established. Many of the ancient religions were phallic in nature. They virtually worshipped the male organ, to be frank, speaking plainly. The obelisk that you see, the tall uh, statue that, you know, looks like, you know, just a big pole. It starts wide at the base, gets narrower as it gets to the top, and then it forms a little pyramid at the top. Uh, the obelisk is a symbol representing the male genitalia. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church has an obelisk at the center of St. Peter's Basilica uh, it, where all the people gather to hear the Pope speak and everything out in the middle. Kind of looks like the, the courtyard out there looks like a great big wagon wheel and in the very middle of it is an obelisk. And that exact piece of stone, that exact piece of stone was excavated from ancient Babylon and brought to Rome and erected at the center of that area. It literally is a phallic symbol. It literally is in deference to gods who um, in ancient times, if you wanted to ensure fertility, if you wanted to ensure your crops, if you wanted to ensure your family was blessed and your profession was blessed, part of the ritual of ancient phallic religions in order to achieve that blessing or that receiving that uh, favor from the God, the false God, you had to engage in a sexual act with one of the priests that represented that God. Now we don't we don't do that in the modern world and you don't I mean they, they there's still religions like that out there, but they're pretty much in the minority these days. Uh, although I could go into a whole lot of detail of how the Roman Catholic Church has borrowed a lot of um, its teaching from ancient Babylon and ancient Rome and that's why they've made procreation such a massive issue because again these ancient religions they did the same thing procreation was the end all and be all that was the most important thing in the world a man could do so uh, when adherence to these religions would have to engage in an activity with a priest or a representative of the temple that represented their false god it had nothing in the universe to do with orientation it had nothing in the universe to do with relationship it had nothing in the universe to do even with the most base element of sexual encounters which would be attraction no you did this strictly for religious reasons it had nothing to do with anything uh, related to interpersonal relationships which is why when the Lord said a man, one to be remembered, one of high esteem, one uh, who is, uh, stands out, he's speaking of the priests. That word that is used in the Hebrew is used, used for a reason. He's speaking specifically to idolatrous sexual practice. Try, I don't have much time. We're, we're going to continue with this next week because we have a lot to do, but I'm going to try to finish up real quick, okay? So what does all of this mean to us? It means in the context of the times in which it was written, God did not want his people to engage in the same ritualistic sexual practices that were common to the pagans and heathens whom the Jewish people would come into contact with. 
as they came into possession of Canaan. Most of the pagan religions of ancient biblical times believed in fertility gods and engaged in a number of practices which involved phallic worship. The priests and priestesses of these false religions would lie with a religious subject sexually in an effort to, assure, to ensure them fertility. It was not at all assumed that the persons engaging in this activity were even remotely homosexual in terms of their orientation, but rather their entire sexual experience with the priest or priestess was strictly an effort on their part to obtain a blessing. By lying with a religious man or woman representing one of these false gods in an effort to receive the false god's favor was an act of idolatry. Now let me bring this into the modern world for you a little bit here a second. There are people in authority, people with power, people, quote, to be remembered, who will suggest to children, who will suggest to women, who will suggest to others that if you have sex with me, God will bless you. You say, well, that's crazy, Pastor. I've never known, I've never heard of such thing. Oh, really? You've never heard of um, Catholic priests molesting children? You, you, you don't think that anywhere in all of that, that the suggestion isn't made that, oh, what you're doing is a good thing. What you, this, this, will, this is a good thing because I'm, I'm God's representative, so therefore if you do this with me, only good things can come your way. See, all of a sudden we start to get a little bit closer to a modern day application, don't we? All right. Okay, now look at the very next verses that follow the much debated Leviticus 18.22. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways because this is how the nations that I'm going to drive out before you became defiled. Even the land was defiled, so I punished it for its sin and the land vomited out its inhabitants. But you must keep my decrees and my laws the native born and the aliens living among you must not do any of these detestable, idolatrous things. For all these idolatries were done by the people who lived in the land before you, and the land became defiled. Aha! All of a sudden things start to come together, starts to make a little bit better of sense. One well, like God just dropped this out of God. He, he starts talking about Molech. The very next verse, he's talking about man with man. He's still in the idolatrous vein. He's still talking in regard to idolatry. He hasn't left that subject matter yet. Okay? Therefore, let me see. I'm sorry, Leviticus 20. And 23, you must not live according to the customs of the nations. I am going to drive out before you. Because they did all these things, I abhorred them. Therefore, what we find in fact is this. The nature of the crime being committed is idolatrous. This is by no means speaking of two human beings who care about one another, engaging in private symbiotic intimacy. But rather, it's speaking of two human beings having no particular inclination toward homosexuality at all. Gee, that kind of sounds like what Paul talked about in Romans 1, leaving their natural affection to do what was not natural to them. Okay? And I'm going to get into that, of course, in the future, all right? <clears throat> Uh, having no particular inclination toward homosexuality, 
lying with a member of the same sex who occupies a position within the religion of a false god in an effort to secure blessing, prosperity, fertility of womb, crops, herds. The Apostle Paul spoke of very similar circumstances in Romans 1. Now, I am not going to go into Romans 1 tonight, but I am going to read this because... Again, it shows you how the Word of God all comes together when you understand everything in proper context. Romans 1, 18-32, The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, I'm reading from the NIV, His invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Now listen, for although they knew God, not they neither glorified Him as God, nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became, past tense, futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened, were darkened, past tense. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images or idols made to look like mortal man, and birds, and animals, and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity. Why did God give them over? Because of the idolatry. You just got through saying it. Mm -hmm. Because of idolatry. God allowed them to be overtaken by them. But why? Because this was part of their idolatry. God said, okay, you want to do this, this crap as part of your idolatry? I'll let you go with it. Go with it. Now listen. Uh, Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires and their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies one with another. How degrading must it feel for somebody who's not gay to have to engage in a... How degrading would it be for somebody who was gay to have to engage in a practice with somebody that you have no interest in, you're not attracted, the only reason you're doing it is for religious purposes. That has to be demeaning and degrading. Okay? He goes on to say, Although, uh, excuse me, um, 25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things, idols, rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. Now, mind you, these people were not naturally inclined toward same-sex intimacy, but rather they purposely, purposely exchanged. I didn't exchange anything. I felt the way I felt when I was five, six, seven years old. Did you exchange anything? Did you one day wake up and say, you know what, I won't be with women anymore. I think I'd rather be with men. No. Okay? But instead of letting the Word of God say what it says, we have to twist. That's I told you folks, that's the, that's the fundamentalist trademark. So they exchanged natural, what was natural to them, for that which was not natural to them. You say, well, who on earth does it? Nobody does. Nobody is going to exchange what's natural to them for what's unnatural. Really? Go to a prison. Prisons are full of people who exchange what is natural for them to what is unnatural. 
They're not homosexual. They don't have any homosexual desires. They have no interest in homosexual relationships. But honey, if they're in prison and they don't have access to a woman, all of a sudden they're willing to trade in their, homose their heterosexuality for uh, homosexuality. And why? What, what is the motivation behind it? Lust. Period. End of the story. So this concept that Paul's talking about here is not anything that ought to be too difficult for us to understand. It goes on in the modern world. People can exchange simply for the sake of lust. They can exchange, okay? In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust one for another. When I was a kid, I wasn't inflamed with lust for nobody. But my heart flittered when certain fellas come around and I had a crush on them, just like a, a little girl to have a crush on a guy or a, guy, a little guy to have a crush on a girl. Okay, it was as natural for me as breathing air. Nowhere in the world did I make any exchanges. Nowhere in the world did I abandon one thing for another. Okay? Then he goes on to say, uh, men committed indecent acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their perversion. Sure, disease is running rampant. All kinds of things start running wild when you start crossing barriers that you, by nature, would not normally cross, okay? Furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. When you understand and you know the history of Rome and you understand the reputation of ancient Rome, their reputation was worldwide. It was one of the most vulgar, nasty, I'll, I'll say one name and immediately you should put it together, Caligula. They used to engage in homosexual. He'd order soldiers to anally penetrate another man as a punishment. Okay? This is the kind of crap that went on in ancient Rome. Paul was writing to the church at Rome. Everything he was saying to them, they understood, applied to their own culture and their own people. He goes on to say, uh, they have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They are senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Although they know God is righteous, although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. I've got to close up tonight, okay? Um, we're going to be going into greater detail about this particular passage in a future session, okay? But it's important to note uh, here that um, these two areas clearly tie in with one another as they are both clearly speaking to the issue of sexuality as it is practiced as part of a religious idol worship. One point, however, if the above passage, Romans 1, is uh, describing homosexual people in general, then either God is a liar or homosexual people haven't any clue as to how they're supposed to conduct themselves. After all, according to verses 29 through 31, all the people Paul writes about are not only perverse idolaters, but they're also God-haters. God-haters. 
Do you know what the largest gay organization in the world is? Has been since the 1960s? MCC, Metropolitan Community Churches. It was a church started by a gay man in order to give LGBT people a place to worship. Why? Because they wanted a place to worship. Why? Because they're not God-haters. And while there are people out there who find fault with us and judge us and criticize us, the whole reason we exist is because we're anything but God-haters. Word of God said, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. We want to worship God. We want to praise the Lord. We want to love the Lord. We want to live for the Lord. We want to walk in fellowship with the Lord. We believe the gospel. We trust his grace, just like anybody else. No, he was talking about the Romans. And they were God-haters because... They were committed to all kinds of other gods. They were committed. They worshipped men as gods. Caesars were considered to be living gods. That's what Paul said. So, uh, he said these same people are greedy. Greedy. Isn't that funny? When AIDS came... And even the government didn't want to respond. Even the government under Ronald Reagan couldn't be compassionate and try to, to quickly respond like they did to COVID, you know. The LGBT community rose up. All of a sudden, all these great organizations came up, act up, and um, I can't remember the name of all the organizations now, of course. But anyway, all these great organizations came into existence, and LGBT people began to support one another. Oh yeah, because it's all about sex. It's all about sex. That's all it's about. And since it's just about sex, we're not the least bit caring of anybody else. We don't care about people's suffering. And the idiotic notion that people would show compassion and would donate millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars just because somebody has sex the same way they do is idiotic and stupid, to say it plainly. But the Apostle Paul said the people he was writing about, he said that they were greedy. He goes down a list. Slanderers, insolent, God-haters, arrogant and boastful, invented ways of doing evil. They disobeyed their parents, senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Not the people I know, and I know thousands. I've been at this for 30 years. Not the people I know. I remember, I'm all close with this tonight because I'm running late a little bit. Years ago, I read an article that appeared in the Dear Abby column of the paper many years ago, many, many years ago. And this lady talked about the fact that she had several children. Uh, and she said, as my husband and I have gotten older and, and we've had health issues and we've had all kinds of uh, needs and things we need, she said, not one of my children has cared to step up and try to help us and help us do anything, she said, but I have a gay son. She said, and my gay son stepped up, he jumped in there, she said, anything we need, he does. Anywhere we need to go, he gets us there. There are people out there who love to paint LGBT people as being anti-family. Asinine. Stupidest words you could ever speak. Most LGBT people I know, those who have been turned out by their families because they're LGBT, they're heartbroken by it. They're hurt by it. What? Because they're not capable of having babies? All of a sudden they're anti-family? No, of course not. I'm an uncle. I love being an uncle. I have 
uh, almost half a dozen nephews and nieces, and I have another bunch of great nephews and nieces. Tommy will tell you, I love being an uncle. I, I take that, you know, uh, to me, I, you know, I try to put as much effort into it as I can uh, because to me that's a special role. I had uncles when I was a kid that I adored and I enjoyed being around, you know, and I've always said, well, that's the kind of uncle I want to be. You know, I want my nephews, my nieces, my great nephews and nieces. To, to feel like being around Uncle Chuck is fun, and you know, and I want to do things. I used to take one of my little great nephews every Tuesday uh, in Dallas. We had a theater. They only charged, what was it, 50 cents or a dollar on Tuesday for the movie. And I would take him every Tuesday to give his mom a break. I'd take him, we'd go to the movie. He liked the video games out in the foyer. I think more than he cared about the movie. We'd go, I'd buy him something to eat. We would play the video games. We'd go in and watch Wally, or we'd go in and watch Horton Hears the Who, you know. And uh, uh, I was trying to build memories with him. I wanted him to remember me. So the day comes, because I'm a lot older than he is. The day comes, I'm not around. I want him to remember, gee, Uncle Chuck used to take me, you know, blah, blah, blah. I have... Uh, cousins who are very, very young. My mother's youngest brother is only about 16, 17 months older than I am. She was the oldest of 10 and he was the youngest of 10. And his kids are the ages or younger even of some of my nephews and nieces. So growing up, uh, he always had them call me Uncle Chuck. They don't, uh, we're, we're cousins. But they call me uncle. And I have a number of cousins that call me uncle. And when I go home to Connecticut, you know, uh, I take them out for pizza. Or I take them out for ice cream. Because I love being an uncle. And I, I love, you know, that is a role. You can play an important role in a child's life as an uncle or an aunt. You know, you don't have to be a mom or a dad. Uh, and and you can really have a positive impact on a child's life. So the notion that LGBT people are disobedient to parents and rebellious and all this foolishness, folks, it is just fiction. So either the Word of God is inaccurate in describing homosexuals in this way, or he was not describing, quote-unquote, homosexuals. He was describing the people of pagan Rome. And I think the latter makes far more sense than the, the first. Amen. All right, folks, we need to close up. Uh, I'm sorry I have to come to such an abrupt end. But next week we will be continuing this exact uh, study that we're in now. I've got a lot, of, a lot more stuff to cover. Let's bow our heads and pray. Master, once again, God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the word of the Lord. We thank you for clarity and understanding. Master, in the name of Jesus, help us to take what we're learning to heart. Help it to minister healing to those who are bruised and those who are broken and those who are hurting those who have been victimized by a negative message of legalism. We ask God in the name of Jesus that you would begin the healing process. Allow each and every listener, Lord, to begin to turn their eyes toward you and understand that your law was not given to torment, your law was not given to condemn. Your law and all the provisions related to the law were given to offer us a glimpse into the precepts of grace. Master, we love you. We thank you, God, for this time in your word. Go with us from this place. Bring us safely back at the next appointed time, for we ask it in Jesus' wonderful, wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. I hope you're enjoying this study. I wish you would be kind enough if you have something 
positive to say. If you have something negative, I'm going to delete it. I'm just telling you straight up. Uh, I don't I, I don't leave that garbage out there because I'm not going to let negativity be seen by others who may look at our video. I'm not going to let the detractors and the negative uh, legalistic dinglings uh, say things that could hurt people. So uh, the second you post something of that nature, it's deleted, so don't waste your effort. But if you have anything to say that's the least bit positive or encouraging, we appreciate the encouragement. Uh, I invite you to post it. And uh, I hope you'll come back and be with us again next. Uh, boy, my sugar's dropping, you can tell, because I'm having a hard time talking. Um, I hope you'll come back and be with us next Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We'll also be uh, having worship, uh, celebration of life in Christ Sunday at 3 o'clock. Central Standard Time. If you live here in Huntsville, Alabama, come on out and be with us. You can find all the information at www.forwardclc, so F-O-R-W-A-R-D-C-L-C, -C, all one word, dot com. And you can go to our website. All the information is there, uh, meeting location and time, so on and so forth. I hope to see you again. God bless you in Jesus' name is our prayer.